In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Glory be to God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forever, and to the ages of all ages, amen. A peace and grace, core family, and a blessed Good Friday to all of you. So during my 40-day retreat in the monastery, I found a book that presented several sayings of the early church fathers, and I noticed that many of them spoke about the mystery of our Lord's crucifixion, so I wanted to share some of their profound writings with you. There are, of course, countless contemplations on today's events on the cross and why our Lord chose to die on the cross as opposed to some other means. There were other opportunities for our Lord Jesus to die. As, as you know, there were times when they wanted to stone him to death or throw him off a mountain, and he could have chosen any one of those means by which to die, but he chose the cross. So there are many other contemplations about today. But I thought the sayings of our early church fathers are still somewhat fresh in my memory. I should spend some time sharing them with you. So our Lord's death is filled with many mysteries that we may have not have considered before, including myself. Uh, for example, one of those mysteries is to consider how could God die? So while Christ's resurrection is a great mystery in his plan of salvation for us, perhaps an even greater mystery is how could the Lord, the source and the giver of life itself, the creator, the almighty, the omniscient or all-knowing, the unstoppable, how could someone like that die? That itself is a great mystery. It was a great mystery even to nature that was beholding its creator on the cross, which led to the supernatural events that we heard earlier, such as the earth waking, the sun refusing to shine. Creation itself could not understand how its creator could die, the one who created all of those things. It was even a great mystery to the, to the disciples who thought once they, once they beheld their Savior on the cross, they thought, okay, that's it, it's over. We all go back to our previous work life. And what did all those three years mean? What is this that he's dead now? So what happens from here on? So clearly it was a mystery for many reasons. And furthermore, why couldn't he, as God, simply spoken one word to defeat Satan and the power of death over us and grant us a new nature? just as he spoke one word to create the world, just by saying, let there be light, there was light, and let there be water, and there was water. Why couldn't he have done that by defeating Satan or death itself, just by using one word? Why spend all that time being incarnate, toiling through life here on earth, and enduring pain and suffering and putting up with us as creation? And so our, our early church fathers in their wisdom helped answer some of these mysteries for us. Even to them, it was still a mystery, but given the the limitations of the language of the human language, they still tried as much as they could to try and explain or to come close to explaining what all of this meant and this great mystery of Christ's death. For example, St. Melito of Sardis, who lived in the second century and was a bishop of the church in Sardis, which is a city in modern-day Turkey today, he was known for his writings in defending the Christian faith. He actually wrote a poetic homily of these days of Pascha, an excerpt of which I'll share with you. So he writes, as a ram, he is bound, and as a lamb, he was shorn. As a sheep, he was led to slaughter, and as a lamb, he was crucified and carried the wood on his shoulders, and he was led up to be slain like Isaac by his father. But Christ suffered, whereas Isaac did not suffer. For Isaac was a model of the Christ who was going to suffer. But by merely being the model of Christ, he caused astonishment and fear among men, for it was a strange mystery to behold, notice the word mystery, it was a strange mystery to behold, a son led by his father to a mountain for slaughter. It's something we can't fathom, taking one of our children to go and slaughter them. That's a, that's a mystery. How could someone accept that kind of request from God? On behalf of Isaac, the righteous one, a ram appeared for slaughter, so that Isaac might be released from bonds. That ram slain ransomed Isaac. So you may recall there was a ram instead of Isaac being slain that uh, God said to Abraham, don't slay your son. There's a ram there uh, to be sacrificed. So also the Lord slain, saved us and bound, released us and sacrificed, ransomed us. Just as that ram that the Lord provided instead of Isaac. For this reason, St. Uh, Miloto con continues, for this reason, the father sent his incorporeal, incorporeal son from heaven that he might bring man to life and gather his parts, which death had scattered when he divided man. The earth quaked, its foundation shook, the sun fled, and the elements turned away. And the day was changed, for they, being creation, could not bear to see their Lord hanging on a tree. So creation shuddered, was confused, and said, what can this strange mystery be? 
The judge is judged and is silent. The invisible is seen and is not ashamed. Our Lord was naked, crucified. The immortal dies and takes it patiently. The heavenly one is buried and submits. What is the strange mystery? Creation was confused. But when our Lord arose from the dead, having trodden down death and bound Satan and released man, then all creation understood that all was done for man's sake. For our Lord, having become man, was judged in order to bestow kindness. He was bound in order to release us. He was seized in order to set us free. He suffered in order to have compassion on us. He died in order that we may be made alive. He was buried in order to raise us up. O oh, strange and unspeakable mystery, they hung on a tree, him who founded the earth. They fixed with nails on a cross, him who fixed the world. And they prepared burial for him who measured the heavens. And they bound him who frees from sin. He suffered passion for you by the cross to free you from passions. He died by the cross to make you alive by the cross. He was buried to raise you. He put on humanity and offered the father man whom he and offered the father man whom he made in his image and perfected in his likeness. And just as from a tree came sin, here he's referring to the tree of um, the knowledge of good and evil that Adam and Eve ate from, which resulted in their banishment from paradise. So just as that tree came from that tree came sin, so also from a tree came salvation. As our beloved Reverend Father Abunab Shoy mentioned, the cross is made of wood from a tree. So from that same from a tree also came our salvation. By the cross, death is destroyed, and by the cross, salvation shines. By the cross, the gates of hell are burst, and by the cross, the gates of paradise are open. So just as the original tree in paradise was a source of our banishment and our curse through Adam and Eve's sin, the new tree, being the cross of our Savior, became the source of our restoration back into paradise and a blessing in our lives. The second mystery is why humanity had to be involved in defeating Satan. In other words, why did our Lord need to be made incarnate in human flesh to complete the work of salvation? Why could he not complete this work simply in his divinity? Why involve any human nature? St. Irenaeus, another church father, he was actually the disciple of St. John the Apostle. He lived in the second and third century and was considered the great, greatest theologian in his time. He writes, since we were bound to death through the disobedience of Adam and Eve, and we inherited their nature, it was fitting that the bonds of death be loosed by the obedience of God, who was made human for us. So God undid the disobedience of Adam and Eve by being obedient to the point of the cross. Because death ruled over the flesh, it was necessary that it should be defeated by flesh. So death defeated our flesh. So in order to undo that death, flesh had to rise and defeat death through, of course, uh, God's help. And that's why God, the Word, became flesh, as we, re as we read in chapter 1, according to St. John's Gospel, that sin might be destroyed by the means of the same flesh through which sin had dominated humanity. So St. Irenaeus continues that on the one hand, unless a human being had overcome the enemy of humanity, the enemy would not have been justly defeated. In other words, since God is a just God, he is just even in his dealings with Satan. So in other words, he wanted, to he wanted to make sure Satan was defeated in such a way in which, uh, which we'll discuss in a few minutes, in such a way that Satan had no excuse to say, well, God, you defeated me because you're God and you're, you're greater than me. So God did not want to leave Satan any excuses over his defeat. So St. Irenaeus continues, it behooved him who was to destroy sin to be made human since humanity had been drawn by sin into bondage and was held by death so that sin should be destroyed by man and humanity be delivered from death. But at the same time, however, God required his divinity to be involved so that his divinity can secure our salvation. God still need to be, needed to be involved in his divine nature to ensure that our, our salvation was secured, because if it was left to a human person, completely 100% human, then that person might, create, might cause some pride within them because they feel they've defeated Satan. So... Pride might have arisen, and of course, sin would, would abound again, and it would redo the sin of Adam and Eve. And that's why we read in the liturgy, uh, the Gregorian liturgy, in the reconcili reconciliation, when, when, we, when the priest says, Neither an angel nor an archangel, neither a patriarch nor a prophet have you entrusted with our salvation. Because again, God needed to ensure that he would safely secure our salvation as a divine being, while at the same time being incarnate so that he can defeat Satan 
by the same nature that Satan defeated in the beginning. So that's why it was incumbent upon Christ as the mediator between us and God the Father to be human, so he can justly defeat Satan and his humanity to enable us as humans to live the same life as Christ did as a human on earth, so that we can also receive God in our life as human beings, which is just as he intended. St. John of Damascus, another early church father who lived in the eighth, the 7th and 8th century, he's considered the last of the church fathers. He wrote, God became human in order that what had been conquered by Satan, that is our humanity, through Adam and Eve's sin, might itself conquer Satan. Now it was not impossible for him who can do all things to deliver humanity from the tyrant by his almighty power and might. But had the tyrant, Satan, after having been conquered, after having conquered humanity, been prevailed over by God, he would have had grounds for complaint. So again, in other words, if Satan was defeated by God simply by God's power, with no humanity involved in God's defeat, then Satan would have had a reason to say, I wasn't defeated justly. So again, it goes to show that God, even in his dealings with Satan, is a just God. And he wants to make sure he leaves, leaves no excuse for Satan to say, I was defeated unjustly. So God, being a just God, wanted to make sure, again, that he defeated Satan also through our human nature. The same human nature that Satan had defeated in the beginning uh, through Adam and Eve. And it's for this reason that the compassionate and loving God wished to make sure that we were, the, we were victorious. So that we today here on earth can also defeat Satan by following our Lord and living a virtuous life as he did. Furthermore, St. John writes, God the Word was made human for this reason. So that the very nature which had, which had fallen through sin and had became corrupt should again conquer Satan through the new nature that God gives us. For that which has not been assumed referring to our human flesh. If God had not assumed our flesh, then we would not have been healed as a result of God's blessing. So our Lord wanted to grant us a new human nature that was not corrupted as that of Adam and Eve, so that we too can conquer Satan using our own free will, which would undo Adam and Eve's free will, which they used to actually distance themselves from God. Another church father, St. Tertullian, who lived in the 2nd and 3rd century, who also defended the Christian faith against heresies, he comments that our Lord Jesus waited to destroy the devil for the same reason he postponed our restitution. So he made space for a conflict in which man, us, might crush our enemy Satan with the same freedom of will which had made us succumb to devil in the beginning. So God wanted us to, to give humanity a period of time through which we can develop our free will and use it the right way so that we can defeat Satan. And it's perhaps one reason why our Lord waited all this time, as we say, he came in the fullness of time to become incarnate and to save us. He gave humanity that period of time to understand what free will is and how to use our free will properly so we can defeat Satan by using our free will. One of the Desert Fathers, St. Macarius of Egypt, who lived in the 4th century, wrote a very interesting dialogue between God and Satan. Once, God, once our Lord Jesus was crucified on the cross, as you might know, he entered Hades to rescue all those who were waiting for him for, for their salvation through the cross. So beginning from Adam and Eve up until the period of time of our Lord's crucifixion. So he writes this very interesting dialogue between God and Satan once God enters Hades. And of course, again, God's purpose of entering Hades was to bring about all of those who are waiting for him. So St. Macarius writes, The Lord comes to death and argues with death. He orders death release from hell and earth the souls and give them back to him. Behold, death is shaken by these words and approaches God's servants and gathers together into a group all his powers, all of Satan's powers, and the princes of evil, and the prince of evil bears forth the signed documents of indentured slaves, referring to us, of course. So we were slaves to Satan, and rightly so, because we gave ourselves to Satan through sin. So he had a signed document showing his ownership over us. So he brings this document to God and says, this is the document proving that these are mine. How dare you come here and ask me to give up someone who I rightly own? So this is the conversation that God is having with Satan. So Satan says, look, these people have obeyed my word. See how they have bowed down in adoration to us, referring to Satan and his kingdom. But God, who is a just judge, shows them his justice and says to them, Indeed, Adam obeyed you, and then through him you captured all human hearts. Humanity obeyed you. But my body, my body, what is it doing here? It is sinless. 
that body of the first Adam was in bondage to you, yes, and you legally held the right of indenture. But all bear witness to me that I have not sinned. I owe you nothing. And that I am the Son of God, all universally bear witness. From above, out of heavens, there came upon earth a voice bearing testimony, saying, This is my beloved Son. So now our Lord is recounting to the devil all of the proof on, on earth to show that he is the Son of God. And of course, Satan was witnessing all of these, and Satan knows scripture, so he understood what God was telling him. So, so God goes on to say, And St. John bore witness, saying, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the world. And again, scripture says, He committed no sin nor was the seed found in his mouth. And moreover, you yourself, Satan, you yourself witness to me saying, I know who you are, the Holy One of God. You may recall when he was being cast out in one of the miracles, uh, the, Satan was screaming to God and saying, I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Where do you want me to go? So Satan knew at some, in some periods of time that this was the Son of God. So God is recounting to him to show that I am God. So God, Christ continues for brought back the body that was sold to you by the first Adam. I tore up the contract that enslaved humanity to you. Indeed, I satisfied Adam's debts when I was crucified and I descended into hell. And I command you, O hell, O darkness, O death, release the imprisoned souls of the children of Adam. And at last, the wicked powers struck with fear, restore the imprisoned children of Adam. Again, it goes to show this kind of conversation that Christ is having with Satan, saying, yes, you, in fact, had ownership over my children, and rightly so, because they willingly gave themselves to you. But now here I am. I have given them a new nature. I am sinless. I have given them the ability to, out of their own free will, do the right thing. They are no longer yours. Hand them to me. And, of course, Satan had to succumb, had to had to accept Christ's command because Satan is not more powerful than God and he had to listen to God. Another mystery is how the tree of the cross upon which our Lord died undid the curse brought on by the tree from Adam and Eve. This idea of, of undoing sin, which our beloved Reverend Father Abun Abshoy uh, mentioned before, is similar to a Word document. So I'm sure many of you have used Word to type up an essay or some kind of um, work document. And perhaps you left your computer open and that file open and maybe one of the little ones came by and started typing all over the document and deleted some sections, added some sections, added some gibberish language because they were just pressing aimlessly. So you come back and you see this document and of course it's not what you intended in the beginning. It lost its original image. Thank God for control Z, undo. Would it not be for that undo button? How difficult would it be to try and recreate that document from memory? could be very difficult. But that undo button restores the document to its original likeness. And that's exactly what our Lord did on the tree of the cross. He undid that curse, that sin, caused by the original tree, the tree of good life. Not that the tree itself caused the sin, but Adam and Eve's free will caused that sin. But he used the same, tree, the same nature, the tree itself, to undo the curse brought by the tree. So this idea of being of undoing sin, also St. John wrote about when he writes, the sin wrought through the tree was undone by the obedience of the tree, that obedience to God by which the Son of Man was nailed to the tree, because Christ, of course, was obedient up until the death of up and up until and including the death of the cross. So by the obedience he showed unto death, hanging on the tree, he undid the old disobedience brought on by the old tree, because of course Adam and Eve disobeyed God and sinned when they ate from the tree. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil was a tree through which man, us, became pompous and prideful towards God. In pride, Adam and Eve ate from this tree and they fell. Their pride was what led them to the fall. But Christ, he came to his tree in humility. Being God, he emptied himself. He didn't have to. He emptied himself, became man like us, and was humble enough to accept the death of the tree on the cross. Adam disobeyed and ate from the fruit, but Christ, being found in appearance as, as a man, as we read in Philippians, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even to the death of the cross. He was crucified on this tree, the tree of reproach, as Abun Abshoi mentioned, the tree of curse, which then became the tree of obedience, became the tree of obedience in our Lord Jesus. And that is why we have so much pride on the, of the cross, because it is our salvation, but also a symbol of life, how to live and humility. 
regarding this idea of descending into Hades after our Lord Jesus was after our Lord Jesus uh, died on the cross and descended into Hades, this idea of releasing the souls. One might think that those were souls of people beginning with Adam and Eve up until the time of our Lord's death, so it probably has not a lot of impact on me. But one of the early church fathers writes, whenever you hear the mention made of tombs, do not because there were tombs, of course, in Hades, uh, in which uh, all, of the pe- all of the children since Adam and Eve were waiting. When you hear mention made of tombs, do not think once only of visible tombs, for your heart is a tomb. When the prince of evil and his angels have built their nest there in your heart and have built roads and highways on which the powers of Satan walk about inside you and in your thoughts, then are you not really a hell? Are you not really a tomb dead to God? So today when we think of God going down into Hades after the cross, to release all of those people who are waiting for him into paradise. This is also a day for us when Christ is coming into the tomb of our heart to release us also from the sins that we have in our heart. Just as we read in the story when Lazarus was raised from the dead, when our Lord commanded the stone to be removed from from the tomb, the God who was about to raise Lazarus from the dead could have easily told the the stone or the, the door of the tomb to move, right? It was not impossible for him. But he needed them to move the stone from the tomb because he needs us to open the tomb of our hearts to allow himself to enter in and shed his light and raise us from our dead. And perhaps in conclusion, the greatest mystery of all of this, of all of the mysteries, and we've touched only on a few of them that the early church fathers addressed, but perhaps the greatest mystery of all is why a God who is so perfect in goodness, who is so complete in peace and joy, he had no gap in himself to fill. He was perfect in his relationship with the Trinity. Why would he think of creating us to begin with, knowing that we would sin, knowing that he would have to empty himself and become man like us and carry our sins? Christ had nothing to gain from creating us. He was complete in joy because if one were to say, well, God created us so that he could be happier, that, that suggests that he wasn't fully happy before us, which of course, God forbid, is not the case. He is God, complete in joy, complete in peace, complete in happiness, complete in any good thing we can think of. So why would he create us? He had nothing to gain. He was perfect in and of himself. But that mystery of creating us and going through the toil and the suffering of bearing our sins and putting up with us for thousands and thousands of years and doing all of this for us is answered in one love. And Sorry, in one word, love. It is because of his love, because he wants us to share in that same joy that he has. He wants us to share in the same sense of peace that he has. Again, he has nothing to gain by creating us. He could have remained as he was without us being around in complete joy, complete peace, having lost nothing. Instead, he created us and gave himself to us so that we can be the ones who get to to participate in his peace, participate in his joy, participate in happiness. There is no other answer than love to answer a question like that. That itself is the greatest mystery, and that is why when we teach our children at home, of course, they'll be, they might often think, focus on, you know, why would God through all of that, go through all of that suffering? Why were people so mean to him? And why would he do all of this for us? The simple answer is love, because he loves us. And that is why the greatest command of all is to love. And that is why when we feel this experience of love that he, is, uh, that he has given us, it would be selfish of us to keep that love only to us, to not share love with others through forgiveness by being patient with other people, by showing long suffering, by extending a hand of help, by praying for people. When people ask us, please pray for me, it's not just a fleeting word or a fleeting thought. This is somebody who could be in need. And because we are all together in one fellowship, it's important for us to pray for each other, to lift each other up. And all of this is rooted in the word love. And that's the only answer to everything that we're going through in this week of Passion Week. The only reason he's doing all of this is that so that we can enjoy that perfection of peace, that perfection of joy and happiness that he is experiencing on his own. He wants us to participate in that. May the Lord grant us the rest of these days a blessed Pascha week, and we look forward to the joy of the resurrection, not just this week, but all the days of our life. May we always remember how fortunate we are as humanity to be participating in that sense of peace, love, and joy that the Lord Jesus gave to us. And glory be to our God forever and ever and to the ages of all ages. Amen.